first of all, I'd like to welcome you all for sticking around to our fifth and final session in this year's research day. This session is looking at advances in surgery. My name is Dr. Don Major. I'm a surgical oncologist and impatibiliary surgeon at both the Princess Margaret Hospital as well as Doctors Hospital. And this morning, I've been given the privilege to moderate this session where we're going to have three keynote speakers, all pioneers in their field, and one surgical resident who's going to be giving us some information from their various fields. So we're gonna dive right in. And our first speaker is that of Dr. Robin Roberts, who is no stranger to the podium. And this morning, he'll be looking at prostate cancer screening in a low resource setting. As we know, Dr. Robin Roberts is a medical graduate at the University of the West Indies, Kingston, Jamaica. He undertook his residency training in urology at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, Canada. He then completed his Royal College of Canada certification in 1986, and this was followed up by a fellowship in renal transplantation. He returned to the Bahamas in 1987 and started out as the first urologist in the government healthcare system. His practice spans the entire spectrum of both adult and pediatric urology. Dr. Roberts has a major focus on men health with a special interest in prostate cancer management and research. He maintains an active partnership with a number of international cancer consortiums. Dr. Roberts, as we all know, was also instrumental in initiating the University of West Indies School of Clinical Medicine and Research, where the majority of us has actually attended, in which undergraduate medical students of the Faculty of Medical Sciences in the University of West Indies can actually complete their final two years of medical school training in here in the Bahamas. The school was advanced to finally include postgraduate programs as well, Dr. Roberts joined the university full-time in 2009. He is a senior lecturer in surgery and now serves as the director. He holds an MBA in healthcare policy and administration from the University of Miami. He is a past president of the Caribbean Urology Association, the Bahamas Family Planning Association and the Medical Association of the Bahamas and the immediate former director of the University of the West Indies School of Clinical Medicine and Research, the Bahamas. Let us all welcome Dr. Roberts on his talk this morning on prostate cancer screening in a low resource setting. Take it away, Dr. Roberts. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for those kind remarks. And But I already looked at the program and I really want to compliment the research team and especially Dr. Holliday and our new director They've worked very hard to make this a success, and it seems very much as what it is. I'm honored and privileged to have an opportunity to speak. I wanted to center my talk, first of all, to meet the, the uh, inclusion for the challenges of COVID-19 and resilience, and secondly, to look at advances in research, particularly with regards to prostate cancer in the Bahamas. And so I shifted my talk a little bit and I want to talk about an integrative healthcare model for prostate cancer screening in the Bahamas. And I owe much of this to my, uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Corey, Don Mitchell, as I call him, he gives his full name, in Freeport, who was the past president of us two, but really is the engine behind the prostate cancer screening in Grand Bahama. And in the community, we have our us two group, we have the Sunrise Medical Center, we have the Lukayan Medical Center, we have the Ron Memorial Hospital and we have the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center. And I'm gonna to try to bring together to show how we have integrated our health service delivery in order to provide the best care we can for our men in Grand Bahama. I think it's, it's true to say, so I'm gonna look first to give a brief overview of the profile of prostate cancer in the Bahamas. I'll give you an update of our integrative model uh, on prostate cancer screening in the Bahamas. We're gonna talk about modeling and forecasting for prostate cancer and look at the forecasting of prostate cancer outcomes from our data in the Bahamas and what are the implications for national policies on prostate cancer screening. 
without uh, reservation, prostate cancer in the Bahamas is the most common cancer in men and the most common cause of cancer deaths in men. And that's probably because 80% of them present at the first time with advanced disease. I think the little data that we do have from the Health Information and Research Unit, uh, although I can't get them to update their data, but I doubt little has changed to show that both prostate cancer and breast cancer are the two most common cancers in the Bahamas. And I no doubt there's a genetic relationship which we are showing for as we as we start to do our molecular screening as well for prostate cancer. Uh, similarly, uh, the head and neck with regards to uh, uh, cancer death rates in the Bahamas. And I think what is uh, striking is that as we have more urologists coming home and we look for our prostate cancer, not only do we see more prostate cancer, but what we find very alarming is our mortality rates are increasing as opposed to decreasing as we are seeing in the developed world. And if you were to extract that on a, on a age specific uh, um, basis, our mortality rates would be probably one of the highest in the world because it's actually more than that of our African-American counterparts uh, in the United States. Well, as we all know that prostate cancer, prostate specific antigen has been the major, has made a major impact in the diagnosis and the treatment of our prostate cancer. And uh, more specifically, uh, with the prostate, with the PSA era, uh, we've seen this significant decrease in prostate cancer deaths, some 40% in the developing countries. But if you remember prior in the slide uh, before in the Bahamas, we have seen the opposite trend. We've continued to increase. And despite this, remarkable improvement in prostate cancer screening in terms of decreasing uh, death rate, the question remained as to whether this improvement in mortality was specifically related to prostate cancer or whether it was more related to the fact that we've improved our surgical techniques, our perioperative uh, our, our clinical delivery, our radiation has gotten better. So it really was in the PSA itself. And of course, this led to the major uh, uh, Atlantic, across the Atlantic trials in both America and Europe, in which they specifically isolated and identified the PSA screening. And lo and behold, it showed that there was no difference in terms of mortality. And this brought the United States Prevention Task Force to come down in 2012 and downgraded PSA screening, saying it did not show any decrease in mortality in these randomized control studies. And that, Europe, uh, in which in fact this, it did more harm and good with regards to the mobility involved, and too many men were there being was no difference. Uh, with that change in policy, we notice over the ensuing five years that number one, with longer period of time, our randomized control studies did show significant improvements in mortality. It just needed more time probably more showing that prostate cancer is a slow disease in its progression. And secondly, what's really changed the tide is that all, this, all the centers were now showing that they had an increase in men presenting with advanced metastatic disease, uh, which, we had, which we had seen a significant decrease before. And uh, so uh, the task force upgraded uh, PSA screening to at least a C, saying that there is merit in doing it, but it should be a shared decision making. Well, what's important for us in the, uh, in the PSA screening uh, era is that there was a significant decrease, some 75 to 80% decrease in the, in the North American setting with regards to men presenting with metastatic disease on the first presentation. And this correlated well with the fact that men were now presenting 80% of them on the first time with organ confined disease, looking to be can potentially cure prostate cancer. And in, at the same time, we were getting more organ sparing diseases. We also had over the last 10 to 15 years, a major increase in new medications uh, for treating advanced prostate cancer. As you can see from apalutamide to enzalutamide, to abiraterone, doctor tassel chemotherapy. And 
for the first time, we were beginning to see overall survival. Could you imagine overall survival of 18 months, okay, and treating a hormonal sensitive disease? It's unheard of in, in, uh, in, um, in oncology. And so what we are seeing now is that we have uh, studies coming out suggesting that even for metastatic advanced uh, prostate cancer, that we possibly might be able to cure this disease. That's very exciting. Uh, the problem is there's no free lunch. It's very expensive. And even though we might be getting our drugs coming from a cheaper market like India, so whereas abiraterone in North America might cost $5,000 a month, and we can get it uh, by almost uh, some more than 75% reduction in cost from India, uh, the drugs which have not reached that market yet remain very expensive. So in developing countries, uh, we, we, we can't afford it. I don't even think America can afford it, but we certainly can. So we believe that going back to the old principle, prevention is better than cure, uh, that uh, the way for us to go screening and early detection uh, because of the decrease in stage, because of the decrease in metastatic presentation, because of the decrease in mortality, and now with active surveillance on early detection of prostate cancer has become an integral part of our therapeutic options, that uh, the best bang for our bucks, particularly in developing countries, was to reemphasize screening and early detection. And so we looked at, uh, at that integrative approach with regards to uh, September screening, as it's done internationally, and with the emphasis for increasing access. So we look, went out into the community uh, for being more available. And along with the access, we get the government clinics uh, where they are very easily accessed by our patients. We did our screening in the evenings and on the weekends. Uh, we had no charge for the screening. We tried our best to have urologists there, experienced physicians, but we were able, particularly in Grand Bahama, to almost have all, this, all the uh, physicians there who would participate. We even had gynecologists coming along to be a part of our clinic. We accepted all comers who came and we wanted to make sure more than anything we were accountable with regards to ensuring within two to three weeks that the patients would be informed of their results. This goes to show you when we started in Nassau in 2004 uh, under the auspice of the Cancer Society and we tagged along uh, with the with the, uh, uh, the gynecologists and doing their cervical screening. Uh, in 2004, we introduced PSA as well as digital rectal exam. And so we see our numbers increasing uh, 200 and uh, they, they peak sometime almost 800. But by and, large, it seemed, by and large, it seemed to be leveling off around about 500 uh, to 600 per year. And in our last, uh, our last screening clinic before COVID, uh, we, we just had under 2019. So uh, somehow it seemed as if we haven't been able to keep up the charge in New Providence. But uh, I, we also have the issues in screening whereby one of the problems we had, the men came, uh, their addresses, uh, their contact uh, were not aligning for a fair amount of them. We couldn't contact them. Uh, there were issues in terms of those who needed to have repeat PSAs in that follow-up or needed to have repeat digital exam. Uh, there are those who might have needed biopsy and those needed definitive treatment. I think that uh, we, we really have to question uh, what, what, what were we really doing? What were we trying to, to achieve other than making men more aware? The situation was a lot different in Grand Baham. Whether it was a smaller community uh, whether the men knew each other or whether the us two group was better organized and they were motivated to ensure that the men would come out. Uh, we could contact them very readily, uh, personally, each one of them. Uh, we could organize the clinic subsequently where they could come and not only get a repeat PSA as needed or have their digital exam repeated. Uh, we were able to do biopsies and we were also able to... Um, to give definitive treatment, uh, particularly for those who did not have a private insurance that we could, we could shift them into the government system. So if they needed surgery, uh, if they needed radiation, that we, we felt that we could give them the access of care 
that they needed to have. I, I, I really believe that it shows the power of volunteers in a smaller, uh, closer community and, and really is, is, is the um, foundation of our integrated for our health care delivery. So you would see that in Grand Bahama, when we started in 2012, that we had, uh, I don't know what happened in 2013. Uh, I don't know if that's when I first came on board, but you can see that we've had a progressive increase in our men. And just before Dorian, uh, we hit the 800 mark and, um, and uh, we everything looked at we were going in the right direction. Um, in fact, we were, we were very pleased that we could follow up all our patients who had abnormal PSAs, abnormal digital uh, uh, um, exams, and, uh, and biopsy them and treat accordingly. And we were able to, to um, compile the data appropriately. And uh, we were able to uh, publish our, our first paper on prostate screening clinic in the Bahamas, a model for low and middle income countries. And I can tell you, uh, we've had quite a number of citations with regards to our approach in, in terms of how we can provide what we consider uh, a care, which to me is, I can say it's non-inferior uh, to what is being practiced in the developed countries. And what we see here um, is that in our first uh, results in 2012 to 2015, uh, when we had our first cohort of patients, and you can see what, what we are getting in the Bahamas. Of those that fell in the criteria for us to biopsy, uh, we found, as we expected, only 10% of those patients who were in the low risk category uh, that could that we feel that we can give curative therapy uh, either by having a radical surgery or by having radiation therapy. And then when we did our next cohort just before um, Dorian, where we had another 27 uh, patients added to the list, you can see our low risk group uh, slowly increasing. And we believe that the trend is going and we would have thought that within the next, by this time, we would have seen a more significant trend, but unfortunately uh, Dorian and, and COVID has done us out. Uh, having said that, looking at, uh, at what happened to, uh, in terms of, of uh, Dorian and the impact, uh, we, had, we didn't have our cancer clinic in September 2019. Uh, we are looking to start again of, uh, next year. We are getting geared up. Uh, and then came the COVID pandemic in March. And so, you know, all elective clinics were closed. Uh, no one could travel. But, uh, but fortunately, by December 2020, uh, we resumed the travel. Uh, and, and, and at the time, we had the, we had the uh, competent authority who waived um, COVID-19 testing travel requirements for physician providers. And so we started going back into Grand Bahama and checking on our patients. And I just wanted to reemphasize the power of the, us two volunteers. Uh, we resumed our clinics in November, uh, in December, no, November, December, 2020, looking at our us two enrollees. Uh, since then, we've had 26, I have done 26 clinics going back in general in my private uh, practice in, in um, Grand Bahama. But at the same time, I've allocated time to see my us two patients separately of no charge. Uh, and we were able to do 13 clinics to date. Uh, we saw 176 men in follow-up. And as of the 28th of October, uh, 2022, we have a clinic which will be booked next week in which we have 30 men already scheduled. So I don't think that we have been that far pushed back with regards to Dorian. I would like to say that we were a little resilient. And in addition to the us two charge, I really want to give commendation to our private labs, uh, both the Lakayan and the Sunrise, uh, the new Sunrise Medical, because we've been able to negotiate for our PSA screening that our, our men who come under the auspices of us two have been given up to a 70% discount in their PSAs. And during the formal screening in October, uh, in, in September, we had raised enough donations that uh, we paid, that is the us two group paid for all the men uh, at the time of screening in, in September. And if you screen outside, 
you got a major reduction in the cost. And if you couldn't afford, then the US2 group would pay for it as well. Again, I want to thank the New Sunrise Medical Clinic and the Rand Memorial Hospital uh, for giving us the, 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 uh, the clinic space uh, in which we could, I bought in an ultrasound machine and we were able to do our biopsies as needed, as indicated by our protocol. Uh, we charged a fee of $100 for the use of the ultrasound machine. And uh, we were able to have the administration in the Iran Memorial Hospital to charge $100 for the pathology. And of course, you, met, you know, men over the age of 65 would have this service done free of charge. So this is the type of integrative uh, the cooperation that we can have that has allowed us to continue to provide the care uh, for our men in Grand Bahama. So I, I think it's, a, it's an excellent example of an integrated uh, healthcare system at the community level up. When we look at uh, the challenges in terms of providing the treatment, unfortunately, as you know, the Rand Memorial Hospital, uh, it is just uh, a couple of months ago that the operating room has been renovated to be used again. And so we basically had no elective surgery being done over the past almost three years. And so we're looking to get that back on target and that's just started as of last month. And so you could imagine the challenges for our senior citizens who could not travel or found it inexpensive to travel uh, and particularly with the radiation and the government uh, with its, with, uh, even though uh, the government provides a subsidy. It still insists that those who under 65 pay at least 50% deposit uh, for their radiation. And for quite a number of them, that's very difficult for them to, uh, to have, uh, to get. But then when we look at our, at our hormonal therapy in terms of uh, adv for advanced treatment, we're very fortunate that NIB uh, plan and getting the hormonal therapy uh, is still on board, and it's at no cost for those over the age of 65, but you can't afford second line uh, treatment because that is not on the formulary, and uh, nor is the chemotherapy on the formulary, uh, which again, uh, I, I want to thank the, uh, the, the, uh, the cancer center, uh, the private cancer center, who has really made a significant reduction in the cost for both radiation and chemotherapy for these patients, so bringing in even the, the private sector in terms of it delivering uh, integrative care. And so while we've had the, um, the challenges of, of, uh, of COVID, uh, uh, I think that uh, we have been able to, to withstand all the challenges and we continue to move forward. But we have to ask ourselves the question. We have spent a lot of energy in terms of human resource, in terms of the cost of supplies, uh, in terms of, uh, of, of the use of our very expensive uh, facilities. Uh, we've seen about 5,000 men and over 12,000 visits. Are we really getting the best value for money? Do we need to see all of these men on an annual basis? Uh, what age should we start? You know, there's a lot of issues with regards to in our high-risk uh, men of African descent. Should we be starting as early as 40? Some even say even in our 30s. And that's what happens when you find you, you find men who present in their 30s uh, with advanced prostate cancer. I just want to put a pin in that for a minute. And I want us to look at uh, something that we are all very familiar with. And that is forecasting for hurricanes. And we being in the hurricane alley, uh, we, uh, everyone is tuned into um, when hurricane is traveling and what might be the potential path the hurricane is traveling uh, because we want to avoid as much as possible the, the catastrophe that occurs when we have a hurricane hit us. Uh, and, but at the same time, uh, we don't want to overspend in preparing for the hurricane that doesn't come. And uh, so uh, it is, it's very analogous to getting ready for, as we age for prostate cancer, the catastrophe that can occur as we age, if we don't get an early checkup and uh, present with advanced disease. So in our hurricane forecast, we look at things like the wind speed, 
whether there's tropical storms, the moisture, the sea temperature, the barometric pressures, what's happening in the eye of the hurricane. And of course, we look at the previous hurricanes, we plot their paths. And so we can see we have the wide range as what could possibly happen. And uh, we have a we have a, 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 a plot from the European side, we have a plot from the American side. And while there might be some differences, uh, by and large, uh, much more in common than the differences. So what if we took that same approach and asked, can we model for prostate cancer? Can we forecast what might happen down the line? And if we were to do that, what are the factors that we would have, or the parameters we would put inside our model and to forecast accordingly and appropriately? And uh, so, yes, we can. We can look at the factors that drive prostate cancer development. We can look at our clinical tumor presentation from T1 to T4 disease. We can look at the presence of METs. We can look at our histology and prostate cancer. We talk about the Gleason score, which is basically a, a profile of the cellular differentiation from well differentiated to poorly differentiated. We can look at the PSA uh, scores uh, and how high they are. Uh, and then we can align them with the natural history of prostate cancer development, just like we're looking at uh, uh, what has happened to in hurricanes in the past, uh, how have they traveled, uh, and what are the regions. And of course, we can look with regards to our black men, we can look at what's happening uh, in black men in North America uh, prior to uh, the introduction of the PSA. Uh, we can look at the SARE data to do that. Uh, we can look at um, prostate cancer trials in the past, when we look at, uh, we can compare what happened in Scandinavia, one of their landmark studies in which they compared men who had radical prostatectomy versus those who had no uh, treatment at all. So watch your vacant and see what actually happened and was there a difference. Uh, we can look at prostate cancer trials uh, where we have screening versus non-screening and look at mortality. And, uh, so, but if we were to do that, how does that fit in? How can we design and align that to prostate cancer growth for Bahamian male population? Uh, well, that's the beauty of what our court study has been doing, uh, particularly in Freeport, because we got quite a lot of data. Uh, we can look at the age and the PSA. We can look at the PSA velocity that we've been following over the past from 2012 up to 28, up to 2019, uh, up to 2022, actually since we've been going through in COVID. We can look at the clinical stage. We look at the histology. We have tissue from biopsies. Uh, so these are the factors that drive prostate cancer development. Uh, we looked at Bahamian life tables. We looked at other causes of death other than prostate cancer and see where we fall in. Uh, we can also put in our Bahamian males, the age distribution from 40 to 84, uh, just as we had that group that is susceptible to prostate cancer. Uh, we have published uh, Bahamian prostate cancer, global cancer data, uh, every year that's done in 2018 on the international scale. And we could compare that to our lifetime data. And so when we look at that information and compare it to the natural history of prostate cancer uh, development, as we just noted earlier, maybe we can develop models and we can forecast prostate cancer. And so uh, that's what we did. Uh, working along with the uh, Fred Hutchison uh, uh, set of, uh, Research Center uh, in Washington, uh, a group that I've been fortunate to to be a part to participate with uh, in terms of their prostate cancer screening program, and they also uh, provided some funding for our studies that we were able to look at this, and they uh, proposed a forecasting. Um, study to look at the Bahamian population to see what would happen down the line, to see what happens if instead of doing um, a test every year, can we do a test maybe just once at the age of uh, 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 one PSA at the age of 45 and one at 50 or one at 55 or one at 60? Or uh, instead of doing just one PSA in a lifetime, what if we did two? One at 45 and one at 55? or one at 50 and 60 years of age, and assume that those men would come and always attend to get their second follow-up. And then we would look at the indications of biopsies 
and particularly those who had a PSA over, over 10. Uh, how would we do that statistical analysis? And then uh, we projected for that age standardized prostate cancer incidence as we had, when we look at our lifetime tables and we projected forecasts for that mortality uh, from 2020 to 2040, uh, in which we would have included the screening test, the biopsies, the cancer detection, curative treatments, where we had overdiagnosis and projected the live save and the live saves gain versus the other causes of death. We also do a sensitivity analysis in which we can look at what is the certainty uh, of the life save versus the quality of life gain. Uh, we have studies from Europe of which they had some concentration of African men. Uh, we could look at stage shift formulation with regards to from high, from those who present with early, uh, very advanced disease and shifted down to to, uh, uh, to low disease, to low uh, organs, confined disease. We also took into account the lead time, lead time biases. And uh, so we designed a model in which we looked at our patients in both the Bahamas and, and both uh, Freeport and Nassau. Uh, we looked at our men who we had, we had followed from in Nassau from 2004, 2018, and in Freeport from 2013 to 2018. Uh, we looked at some 808,720 tests that were performed, uh, which represented about 5% of the men in the age group between 40 to 70. And uh, our experts at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, of course, you know, all of this is way over my head. And they also looked at their model on the American side. And then we also had a European model from Erasmus Medical Center micro simulation screening analysis model. And uh, earlier this year, uh, we, we presented, we uh, submitted our results uh, on the evaluation of prostate cancer screening strategies and a low risk, high, low resource, high risk population in the Bahamas uh, in, in JAMA. Uh, and uh, it's quite an interesting read. Just wanted to show one or two uh, um, um, of, the, of the forecasting that we've done. And here is the, uh, the model from the Fred Hutchison group. And here's the one from the European group. And so here it is where we're looking at men who, and, and this line would show us what age they were and what they would have had one test and, uh, and how they projected. And you would see that on this group here in the European model, that while one was seeming to downstage and one was seeming to upstage, they almost crossed over in terms of the incidence. The key point here is that the incidence really hasn't shifted that much now as to where we would expect 20 years from now. And uh, when we uh, adjusted for mortality, you can see that there was no difference in mortality in the projection, whether we did one PSA or whether we did two PSAs. Uh, this is a very interesting uh, 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 um, uh, study that I just wanted to take a moment because when we looked at the, what we call the projected absolute numbers of medical resources and the corresponding mortality benefits for specified screening strategy, I, I just looked at this particular program in which we had one test done at 60 years of age in a straight line. And so it shows that the number of tests we would have done for this one test, if we did the entire population, we would have done from 40,000 to 42,000, excuse that error, of men. The number of biopsies we would have done would have been from 1,200 to 2,200. The number of screening uh, uh, cancers we would have detected uh, from would have been from 700 to 800. And the number of additional cases we would have treated because of screening from 100 to 400. And we would have had in terms of, we would have required some 500 to 600 lives we would have saved uh, from some 10,000 to 14,000 prostate cancer deaths. So you can see that uh, just even doing one test um, has uh, serious implications for policy with regards to the cost. But I just want to show this table because I think it really highlights where we are 
and, uh, and looking at what it is that we are prepared to give up. Um, this would be for when at the age of 60, if we did one test and we looked at the, um, at the European model, we would have saved 84 lives in one of their projections, 74 in the other one, so not that much difference. The level, the model biopsies you would have done was 2.6 to 3.8, not much difference. And even in terms of overdiagnosis, in terms of the life saved, essentially one life you would have saved. Compared to if we did the same model on the white males from 55 to 69 years of age, every year, and they came, they would have had 916 tests. They would have had 32 biopsies in order to save one life and five cases would have been overdiagnosed. I don't think when we look from a proportional point of view that we have that amount of money in order to spend with regards to doing cancer screening on an annual basis. So yes, of course, there are quite a lot of limitations in the study. Most of our, these modeling studies, there are few black men in them. Uh, um, we always question the morbidity and mortality data in the global can uh, 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 profile that we have for the Bahamas because it's more projecting a hospital-based registry as opposed to a national-based registry. There will be variations in histology comparisons and progression of the disease and it's clinical on a clinical basis. Uh, the model differences between overdiagnosis and underdiagnosis. And of course, access and availability of our treatment option with regards to cure rates with the uh, developed countries compared to ours. But these are the type of policy decisions we must make because with the introduction of PSA, we have what I call sprung up, the prostate cancer industry and the product line. We have all various types of PSAs. We've got new biomarkers. We have ultrasound now and MRI. And now the new PET CT with, 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 uh, with the gallium 68 PS prostate cancer membrane screening, uh, that costs $5,700 when I send my patients to get one of those in the US. And uh, so they are now talking about using MRI to diagnose prostate cancer to avoid the morbidity and potential mortality from prostate cancer biopsies. Is this the way we're gonna go? And I haven't even mentioned treatment with regards to radical treatment and the laparoscopic and the robots and the new radiation from bracket therapy to proton beam and the minimal invasive. And so how do we get the most of our few dollars that we have? So I really wanna end and saying that we have to look at these new policy approaches. And one of them in which I'm trying to get a, 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 a forecasting model for us. And we're talking today about the median PSA. And what we do in the median PSA is that we look within each decade. So in the 40s and in the 50s and in the 60s, we would look to see for that male population, what would be their average PSA uh, on a screen. And if when we get that pop for that population, and we have found that in some of these, uh, as, as of being in this population uh, in, in North America, from 1989 to 2001 for 36,000 men, we were able to look at the PSA, median PSA in the 40s to be 0.7 and 0.9 in the 50s and 1.9 in the 60s. What they have found is that if when you do your one PSA in your 40s, if it is less than the median, then you're okay. You don't have to repeat your PSA again until you're in your 50s. But if you are above the median, then you have a seven times more likelihood of developing prostate cancer when you get into your 50s. And so these are the ones you now might have to follow up on an annual basis. We've also shown that for men in your 60s, when you reach 60, if you got a PSA of less than one, the chances are you'll never get prostate cancer. So you don't ever need to do another PSA. And so I believe that these are the directions in which we need to go in developing countries. And I firmly believe, and that's my favorite photograph I want to end, of the prostate cancer screening clinic in Grand Bahama. This is 6.30 in the morning. The men are already lined up, waiting for us to open our doors 
at eight o'clock on a Saturday morning that we can have uh, on that day over 400 men who have come to get their PSA uh, testing done. So I firmly believe that men, contrary to what, what, uh, what is the prevailing thought in our culture, men are concerned about their health. And if they are made aware of, of, uh, of bettering their health and the opportunities uh, they can access and it's available for them, I believe that they are prepared even better than women to better their health. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Roberts, for that wonderful talk on screening and prostate cancer here in the Bahamas. I want to congratulate you for the, the few papers that you have got published and getting some Bahamian data out there so the world can, can realize what we have to offer. Uh, I'd like to see this wonderful push that you have for screening. I uh, just have one question before I kind of open up the floor. I know that the, the digital examination is the dreaded exam by most men here in the Bahamas. I didn't see you talk much about it, so I, I suspect that it's, is it no longer required when you're screening or do you just get a PSA? Can you talk a bit more about that yeah. for me, please? My, yeah, my, 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 um, my opinion on PSA, uh, on digital record exam is very clear. The evidence is, it's, all, it's, it's very clear that PSA far supersedes digital erectile. And the case can be made, the studies can be made that one can do with PSA screening and no digital erectile exam. So that is not for the day. The old studies what used to show that uh, you get the best yield in combining both PSA and digital erectile exam because in the case of advanced prostate cancer, uh, where the PSA might actually be normal, but in up to 15% of cases, you actually have very hard rock prostate. And I guess the supposition is that the, the, the tissue is so anaplastic that it can't produce PSA. Um, what I try to do is to say you need a digital rectal examination, and I emphasize that for change in male behavior towards their health. Because I, I think men should be aware that the anal region, like all offices, are very important and should be examined at all your annual exams. No one looks at their back passage. No one, no one takes the mirror in the day to look and see what lesions might be there. You can also pick up other lesions other than prostate cancer, rectal exams, rectal cancer or anal cancers. So I make the case that yes, we should continue to push digital rectal examination in terms of a comprehensive or holistic approach to male health. And I can tell you these 800 men, when they come to the clinic, that's the biggest joke for them. They see no problem at all. And, uh, and, and so I think they can get over their fear uh, and their phobia uh, with regards to this digital rectal examination. So that is my approach. Thank you. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Roberts? Yes, um, Dr. Major. So Dr. Roberts, would you say that that rectal examination is probably far more important for detecting the BPH, and hopefully to combine that with history, maybe delay the progressive obstructive uropathy that may occur in a lot of our patients? Um, no, I don't even want to say that. I want to say that digital exam is important, period, because one can also argue that when you do a digital rectal exam, all you are feeling is the posterior aspect of the prostate. You don't know what's happening in front of you. If you really want to look at size, you got to do an ultrasound of the prostate. And not only that, while there is evidence to show that the bigger the prostate, the more likely you are to have obstructive issues down the line, but equally you have these small uh, uh, prostates, which can be very obstructive because the, 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 the the truth of the pie is not the rectal part of the prostate, it's what's happening around the urethra, that periurethral zone. So I would like to say that a digital rectal examination is a fundamental part 
of evaluating prostate health, full stop. Okay. Be, it prostate, be it for inflammatory process or neoplastic, be them benign or malignant. Okay, there are a couple of questions in the group. One from Kay Simmons. How are the PSA screening numbers under NHI? Uh, well, that's a very sore point for us right now. Uh, you know, we included that in the PSA screening. And what I'm looking for, and I'm hoping that by January or so, that we'll be able to do that, that we'll be able to hit the button because a very important part of our primary care package was our electronic health records. And uh, such that all those laboratory results are loaded up on the electronic health records so that we'll be able to see those men who have abnormal PSAs and what has happened to them. Well, of course, you know that the biggest problem right now we have is making sure that the pay, that the physicians, the providers, put the pay, put that information in the damn in, in the electronic health records. So that is the reason why we haven't had that yet. So, uh, but we but we know how to do that. All we say, listen, we're gonna we, we're gonna withhold your pay until the information goes in. So we have done that over the last two to three months, and there has been a significant uh, 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 increase in regards to. The, our providers being compliant and putting in the data. So I can't tell you what that is now, but I want to be able to tell you by about January or February. And I hope that Dr. Cooper would back me in saying that we will be able to look at the whole, that, that profile of our PSAs for our men in the Bahamas on the NHI. But it just brings up another point, which is even worse than that, is now we have these men with abnormal PSAs. How are you going to treat them? Because now, they have to pay for specialist care, uh, even if they go to the hospital. And then, if they go to the hospital, they do not have the they do not have the luxury of of uh, of of private care as they have in primary care. You have to join the line inside the Princess Margaret Hospital, and we now have backlogs which are going into years. And so, when we talk about access and availability of care, we got some serious issues that we have to address. Okay. Are prostate cancer deaths increasing or decreasing in the Bahamas, Dr. Laville? Yeah, no, I think that prostate cancer deaths are, are continuing to increase because if you look at what happened to prostate cancer in America when they introduced PSAs, within the first two to three years, there was a tremendous speak. You know, it doubled. In fact, they were so frightened because they were seeing instead of the usual around 200,000 a year, it doubled, it went to over 400,000 people because you had a backlog, okay? So we've got a backlog of men who have not um, sought medical attention. They have not been diagnosed. So what you're gonna see until we have our PSA screening program uh, uh, control, you're gonna see for the first, for the next four to five years, a significant increase in our prostate cancer mortality. And that even that, that's even more the reason to push to get over this phase and so we can see it stabilized. And you actually would have seen that inside that uh, forecasting model where initially you saw an increase and then you saw the decrease in prostate cancer in both of the models. Okay, one final question. Dr. Frankson, you can open your mic. See you have your hand raised. Dr. Frankson, you there? Okay, if not. All right, oh, I, I am, I am, um, are you hearing me now? Yeah, yes, yeah, do. yeah, you were muted. Because, because they, um, they have ultimate control, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Roberts. Yes. Thanks, a great presentation as usual. Um, the, 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 the query that I have is, um, I think what you're driving at as far as MRIs is concerned that is that not really justify, uh, uh, um, appropriate technology in our setting. Yes. Is, is, am I putting words in your mouth or? Uh, let me put is, it to Is there a case I, to be made for it? For those, um, especially those, you said 15%, you know, which is, um, that's one out of every eight to nine men who have prostate cancer. Um, the PSA will be normal. Uh, is it that ultrasound would also have failed to pick those up? No, ultrasound. Or, and, and the MRI would be 
shy, um, the, 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 having a better specificity and sensitivity for that? Ultrasound has never been able to uh, diagnose prostate cancer on imaging. Because when you look at the pictures, you can have the spectrum of prostate cancer where mm. it can be uh, uh, where it can be hypodense or hyperdense or isodense. And so ultrasound is used to define where you should put your needle in order mm. to ensure you are getting the sample of, uh, right. of, of, of tissue. So ultrasound is out with regards to diagnosing prostate cancer. So does the, does the MRI then the MRI look, look, also look even more relevant now? Yeah, the, yeah, what has happened is that as they have upgraded and they now have the Tesla 3 um, um, MRI, they now can have the resolution using the pyrads in defining prostate cancer, clinical prostate cancer in particular, with a significant degree of accuracy, sensitivity. And so the new trend now is that in order to avoid or to determine if you should have a PSA or not, is to do an MRI scan first, and then you would then then you can detect a possible lesion. Then you can biopsy that lesion. And what you have shown is that if you have when they grade from period one to five, that those period four and five that the probability that you will hit a cap prostate cancer is like 80, 90%. And uh, so, so that is becoming the new approach. Now, if you were now to look at this extended across a population basis, you must therefore have it where the government that provides 70% of the care must be able to drive down the prices. So the government would either buy formerly an MRI machine that can make it more affordable, or you can, they can go and they can say to those private fellas out there, listen, you know, if you were to extend this to the population, can you drop the price? Instead of charging $900 to $1,000, can you drop that down to $300 or $200? Okay, so, so those are the, the uh, public-private partnerships that I think need to happen uh, because MRI now, has, is becoming the new standard of care with regards to uh, diagnosing our prostate cancer. And then the other part where it's really going to be a big issue is the new, P, the new PET scan uh, 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 with, with, the, um, with the prostate-specific membrane antigen. Uh, that's, that's revolutionizing the, detecting our occult prostate cancer. And uh, so, again, you're looking at very costly medicine. So, you know, what is going to be the government's role if it wants to provide, as they would normally say, uh, the health care that the Bahamian population deserves? So it's going to be very challenging. And that's the problem I have with NHI. That, that's, that's where it should be going if you're going to look at universal health care, uh, universal health coverage, where no one should be denied care because of inability to afford it. Okay, Dr. Roberts, thank you again for that wonderful presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Krista Nottage. Dr. Nottage is a fifth and final year surgical resident in the Department of Surgery at Princess Margaret Hospital. She is a quite hard working resident and always has a smile on her face and is pretty happy to come to work all the time, which is contagious. So I'm pretty excited to listen to Dr. Nottage's talk. She actually has two talks for this morning. Her first talk that we have here for her is on the patterns, distribution, and outcomes of pancreatic cancer at the Princess Margaret Hospital, Nassau, Bahamas, during the years of 2008 to 2017. Dr. Nottage. Good morning, all. Thank you for that lovely introduction. I'm very pleased to be here to share some of the research happening in the surgical department with you. So I will begin. My first presentation, as Dr. Major mentioned, is on pancreatic cancer surgery at the Princess Margaret Hospital between the years of 2008 and 2014. So as an introduction, Pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma is considered one of the deadliest cancers, as we know, and surgical resection is 
truly the only chance for cure and surgery plus adjuvant therapy are the only viable options for long-term survival. The increase in pancreatic cancer as a leading cause of death reflects poor treatment options available in this sector more than its prevalence. The aim of this study was to document the pattern and distribution of this disease um, within the pancreatic cancer community in the Bahamas and review the outcomes associated with surgery. So in our methods, we had a retrospective chart review beginning in January 2008 until December 2017. Our target population were all patients diagnosed with pancreatic cancer during the study period who were treated surgically. The available population patients presenting to the Princess Margaret Hospital, the public tertiary care facility in the Bahamas. And the focused search was done by the hospital's medical records department looking for diagnoses identified as per the sign-out diagnosis, as well as the cancer registry. You can see here some of our inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, including the diagnoses of uh, adenocarcinoma, neuroendocrine carcinoma, ampullary carcinoma, et cetera. They had to have presented at the Princess Margaret Hospital, and they had to have been undergoing surgical intervention. Excluded were any patients with a diagnosis other than those stated there, and patients presenting to any institution other than PMH for the Princess Margaret Hospital, and patients who did not go on to have surgical intervention. In our results, the total patient population reviewed between the two dates numbered some 146 persons, all of whom were noted to have pancreatic pathology. 96 of these persons met our inclusion criteria with respect to place of presentation and the intervention being surgical. However, only 20 of these cases that had surgical intervention uh, were pulled for further analysis and study because they had the desired data we needed. Also in our results, the pancreatic odudenectomy, famously known as the Whipple procedure, was performed for the majority of patients, 87%. 15 of the 20 surgical specimens after that procedure were identified as pancreatic adenocarcinoma on histology. The remaining five histological results included papillary cyst adenocarcinoma, neuroendocrine tumors, and a diffuse B-cell lymphoma in a solid pseudopapillary tumor. These five, the latter five, were excluded from the in-depth analysis and survival calculation. Among our results, we can see tumor size and location and histology. The majority of tumors were located in the head of the pancreas, with the second most common location being the pancreatic tail. And the predominant pathology was ductal adenocarcinoma with a histological grade of two. I want to focus on three outcome measures from our study, the margin status, lymph node harvest and lympho lymph node positivity, and survival. In the surgery for pancreatic cancer, the status of the resection margin, particularly that of the SMA uncinate pancreatic neck and the retroperitoneal, re retroperitoneal margins, as well as the lymph node status and tumor grading have been found to be significant prognostic factors. Looking at our survival analysis, we saw that the median overall survival time was 15 months. Our 30-day mortality or perioperative mortality was 20%, with the end number being three of 20. Our two-year survival um, was 20% as well, and our five-year survival, only one patient made it beyond five years, and that gave us a 66% five-year survival for this cohort. Discussion. This study gathered information from the population on the site size, number of nodes, margins, and histological differentiation of pancreatic tumors. The study did demonstrate some features contributing to poor prognosis and outcome, namely, our tumor size tended to be greater than or equal to three centimeters, and we had high lymph node ratios at greater than 0.2. The pathology differed, being mostly grade two or moderately differentiated versus poor differentiation when you look at uh, the literature out there for poor prognostic indicators. Our study found no significant difference between the sexes in terms of diagnosis. I wanted to share some quality metrics in pancreatic surgery, and I got this quote, you can't improve quality if you can't measure it, and to measure quality, you need robust, valid data. This is a quote from the American College of Surgeons, promoting their NISQIP, or National Surgical Quality Improvement Program, which is a data analysis program for evaluating and improving quality of service. In 2009, 
Billy Mori et al. understanding the need for monitoring, standardization, and improvement in care quality for pancreatic cancer undertook the project of identifying and validating a series of quality indicators. The results of this Bill Moria study identified various indicators in each of the five domains of care being structure, process, appropriateness, efficiency, and outcomes. Among the outcome-focused indicators, high and moderate validity was given to those of margin negative resection rate, perioperative mortality, ideally less than 5%, and a stage-specific two- and five-year survival rate. In this study by Abbott et al., this was a multivariate analysis of some 1,400 patient cases in a consortium database. And they looked at margin status, the number of lymph nodes, tumor grade, and the delivery of adjuvant therapy within 60 days as indicators of quality. Interestingly enough, this review by Abbott et al. included a survey of HPV surgeons looking at their opinions on the importance of gathering different quality measures in pancreatic surgery. What we can see here is that there is some um, consistency in terms of margin status, estimated blood loss, and two- and five-year survival rates as parameters with high perceived importance and low actual practice. That's an interesting that is an interesting point to bring out that we can recognize those indicators that would improve quality. However, in our practice, are we actively uh, pursuing those quality indicators? And so there's some discordance between perceived importance and actual practice, as is shown by the two arrows there. Also in this study, we do see some of the pathological variables that were noted to have a significant correlation with survival, such as an R1 resection margin or microscopically positive margin at both the pancreatic neck and retroperitoneal areas, lymph node positivity, and tumors found to be high grade or poorly differentiated, all being associated with poor overall survival. In our study, we gathered data on some of these quality measures, the results of which I'll share with you. Our study's outcomes mirrored quite closely one by Yao et al. in 1997, which examined 650 pancreaticoduodenectomies, and they found a median survival time of 18 months, ours being 15. They too had tumor sizes greater than or equal to three centimeters. They had some evidence of positive margins and presence of lymph node metastasis. Their tumors, however, were overwhelmingly grade three or poorly differentiated on histology. So in our margin assessment, among the 15 cases deemed resectable, we had three cases that were found to have positive or R1 microscopically positive margins. The two positives were at, two of the positives were at the pancreatic neck margin, and one was at carcinoma in situ at the common bile duct. <clears throat> the SMA or uncinate margin, also known as a retroperitoneal margin, is most commonly positive. <clears throat> what I'm thinking in our study is that we may have also recorded that as pancreatic neck margin. When you go back and look at it, we're talking about this SMA uncinate margin. And operative standards really stress techniques such as careful dissection of the periadventitial plane that lies on the anterior and right lateral aspect of the superior mesenteric artery as critical to achieving oncological outcomes. This vessel needs to be skeletonized in the surgery from the level of the first jejunal branch of this superior mesenteric vein to the takeoff of the SMA from the aorta in order to get your margins. And I'll show you here, this image was taken from a text called Operative Standards, and it shows improper and proper technique for dissection of the superior mesenteric artery. And this is really a shift in practice and technique that has happened over years, lots of trial and failure and trying to improve the quality of pancreatic surgery. So it reads that exposure of the proximal SMA is required for a safe periadventitial dissection. And performance of this exposure should be done by a sharp dissection, either using an ultrasonic dissector or harmonic scalpel, as is seen in the picture, um, or using thermal dissection using a ligature, as we do commonly here. The use of a stapler, as was previously prevalent, is associated with leaving behind up to 43% of the alve alveolar or lymphatic tissue on the SMA. And of course, that would give suboptimal pathological outcomes and analysis and higher rates of an R1 or microscopically positive margin. 
the standard lymphadenectomy. So lymph nodes as a quality metric are also important. As the previous studies mentioned, we're bringing up um, lymph node involvement is important for prognostication of localized tumors. The quality of the pathological staging depends on the ability to evaluate a representative sample of lymph nodes. The agreed upon number is a minimum of 12 lymph nodes by the AJCC. However, if a lymphadenectomy, a lymphadenectomy is carried out according to standardized technique, you will get a harvest of somewhere a median between 13 and 17 lymph nodes. So this diagram is showing all of the different areas that are targeted for lymph node harvest in pancreaticoduodenectomies or Whipple procedures. In a 2009 study published in the Journal of Gastroenterology gastroenterological surgery, it showed that actually a lymph node ratio was the most important and strongest prognostic factor after resection for pancreatic cancer, as opposed to looking at lymph node numbers themselves. So the lymph node ratio is the number of lymph nodes involved or positive taken against the number of lymph nodes examined, and is shown to be more meaningful in the analysis. And studies have shown that a lymph node ratio greater than or equal to 0.2 is associated with poor survival and predictors of poor outcome in both univariate and multivariate analysis. So not the lymph node involvement isolated, but especially as a ratio is an independent prognostic factor after resection of pancreatic cancers. And you can see in our results that we had a lymph node ratio of 0.25, so greater than 0.2. In our survival analysis, our median survival time was 15 months in this study and reflects a value common in studies of pancreatic cancer in the pre-adjuvant therapy era. The five-year survival rate was around 6%. And the median, in the literature, median survival following a diagnosis of pancreatic duodenal adenocarcinoma is four to six months. 10 to 20% of those diagnosed with pancreatic cancer will be candidates for surgery. And of those patients candidates for surgery, the median survival is 20 to 22 months, and the five-year overall survival rate approaches 25%. So we're not too far off on our median survival, but our five-year overall survival, we can use some improvement on. So this study has limitations. It was a small sample size. It was retrospective. It depended on um, the inconsistency of recording in our notes as well as paper medical records. There were many missing pages and investigations. Some considerations therefore for going forward on studying this uh, entity in pancreatic surgery and quality improvement, looking at the whole population of persons diagnosed and the treatment pathways offered, not just that of surgery. Following up on adjuvant therapies where received and looking at the outcomes for those patients. Establishing better and more standardized recording of operative complications. That was an aspect that um, we really should bring out in the next iteration of this study. And considering a movement toward a single standard approach to this surgery and follow on analysis of outcomes thereafter. So areas of ongoing research, um, you, looking at the significance of adjuvant therapy, there have been many uh, entities that have come onto the market that have been studied since um, our study has been completed as well as over the years that could speak to the successes or failures of adjuvant therapy. So I need to research that a bit more and looking at the use of neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which is now definitely in use at our hospital as well as the world over. Operative blood loss is one of those things that came up frequently in the reading and we need to take count of, as well as complications, as I mentioned. So in conclusion, this study did find that the pattern of disease in the Bahamas reflects that of the established literature. We found that our patients presented with an advanced age and an advanced stage, and the predominant pathology was ductal adenocarcinoma. Thank you very much. These are my references. Thank you, Dr. Nordage, for that interesting talk on pancreatic ductal carcinoma. And uh, as we know, it is a, a pretty challenging disease to deal with and the mortality rates are relatively high. So before I open up the, the floor to questions, I just had a couple for you. Now, when you, you state that three of the patients had R1 resections, were you able to kind of tease out the survival based on R1 versus R0 resections? Because it looks like you kind of grouped them all together. And then I know in the last slide, you said that um, this data basically coincides with the pre adjuvant therapy. 
we were able to kind of determine how many of these patients actually went on to get adjuvant therapy, or that would be a part of a further study. Thank you for those questions. And those are areas that I have identified myself that I need to do for the study, and especially that of the adjuvant therapy. Um, given our oncology center, um, I think the next step of this would be for me to look at those patients whom I've studied the 20 and whether or not they received adjuvant therapy. Um, their mean survival being 15 months, it may be that they never actually made it to adjuvant therapy. As we know, the wait times to begin in our setting are quite long, but um, that is an area that I have not yet teased out and definitely wish to include in my future study and expansion of this topic. The survival rate of R1 versus R0 resection. So that again is another avenue that I would have to tease out going forward because with those three positive margins, um, we do suspect that uh, sharp dissection on the SMA and unsinit was not performed. So it may be partly, um, it, was, it was one of the earlier surgeries that was done. And so it may be partly that, and I would need to tease out those patients' um, identifications and follow up on when their survival occurred, their survival drop off. So those are both areas going forward for me. Okay, thank you. Great talk. Um, I see we have a question from the group. Dr. Cowich, I see you have your hand raised. Thank you, Don. Um, congrats, Dr. Nottage, on a, on a fantastic presentation. I, I'd like to specifically congratulate you for presenting this data because, as you know, there is a, a push for these complex operations to be done only in high volume centers. And unfortunately, there are none in the Caribbean. So, adding data to the, like this to the world literature really helps to push the change in practice to say that these things can be done safely in small volume hospitals like we have in the Caribbean. So congrats. But my specific question, I noticed that you uh, reported that 20% of patients had positive pancreatic neck margins. Now, that's quite a difficult area to dissect because the superior mesenteric vein um, port slash portal vein is, is quite close. So I just wanted you to comment on the use of vein resection and reconstruction at the time of Whipple's and the use of intraoperative frozen section in an attempt to reduce margin positivity at the neck. Thank you. So as you've mentioned, those are two of the options that we can use um, and that are used, especially in, in larger centers to mitigate against that positive margin, as well as the uh, operative techniques that I spoke of in terms of using a sharp dissection. Now, frozen section is almost the right-hand man of trying to get close margins to be negative. Um, and the availability of frozen section is, is uh, not always there um, in our hospital when we are doing these surgeries. But what frozen section allows you to do is to perform your resection and send down some of the specimen to be analyzed microscopically to say the distance of the nearest um, cancer cell from your margin and to let you know whether you have an R0 or microscopically negative margin or whether there are tumor cells um, at the microscopic margin, which would tell you to continue your surgery. So frozen section is a tool that we can use intraoperatively to tell us if what we have done is adequate or whether we need to do a bit more before having to close the patient and bring the patient back or having to add on other therapies to deal with an R1 margin. The vein resection um, has also become, in modern surgery, an option as we've understood more and more of the anatomy of the area and as our techniques have grown. Um, and so you can, in, in the area of where the pancreatic neck resides, as Dr. Couch said, the portal vein is a vital structure resides there, um, as well as our superior mesenteric artery. And when a tumor encroaches upon the wall of those vessels, you have to decide whether you need to resect those vessels, which that you can resect some of the venous structures and provide a bypass such that the patient uh, can survive without significant morbidity. But in terms of the techniques, I'm not well versed to speak on the vascular techniques at this point in time of the resection, but uh, I knew that they do exist and can provide you some wiggle room in trying to get a negative margin where the encroachment is close. And in pancreatic surgery, we always talk about 
resectable, borderline resectable, and unresectable. And that often has to do with how much of the vessels are involved. And that has the, the ability to resect the vessels has really changed or moved um, the scale in terms of what was previously unresectable may now be borderline resectable or resectable because you can do vascular procedures to give yourself a negative margin. So thank you for bringing that up. I think we're running a bit behind time now, so we're probably going to have to save the remainder of the questions for the end. So our next speaker is, again, we're going to welcome back Dr. Nottage, and she is going to give her talk on, it's a case report, the evaluation and management of an incidental duodenal polyp in the third part of the duodenum. Dr. Nottage. Thank you. I'm just going to upload. Okay, thank you again and for allowing me to present a second time in this forum. This is a case report of a patient that I met on the general surgical service here at the Princess Margaret Hospital. So brief background, the duodenum, named for its length in Latin meaning 12 fingers, is 25 to 30 centimeters of C-shaped small bowel that lies between the pyloric sphincter of the stomach and the ligament of trites. Exclusive of its first part, it is primarily a retroperitoneal organ and has been studied and pondered upon by surgeons dating back centuries. We know about the famous or infamous ampulla and the head of the pancreas, but what takes us into the third part of the duodenum? Duodenum polyps or duodenal polyps are not very common and the prevalence range estimates between 0.3 and 5%. Where they do occur, they're often due to either sporadic occurrence or found incident as those found incidentally on endoscopy, like in this case, or as part of syndromes such as FAP. Polyps can be differentiated by those that involve the major or minor ampulla and those that are non-ampullary, as in this case, and tumors of the duodenum may present with jaundice or obstruction or an upper GI bleed based on the features and the different um, pathologies within that polyp. The goal of management when a polyp is encountered is to determine the histology, ameliorate any symptoms, and eliminate cancer risk. This typically involves removal of the polyp, and the risk of cancer does increase with size, and that risk lies anywhere between 30 and 80 percent. They are most often clinically silent, and particularly those of the non-ampullary type, whereas periampullary or ampullary tumors and polyps may present with clues of biliary obstruction. Detection in most cases of non-ampullary duodenal tumors or polyps, therefore, is usually done by uh, endoscopic incidental finding. So here are some of the fathers of surgery in this area. So historically, initial dogma found that uh, absence of a duodenum was not consistent with life. That was until 1935, when Dr. Whipple did the first total duodenectomy. Surgeries on the duodenum have been challenging due to the anatomical complexity of the area in which the duodenum is found and displayed in this picture. Surgeries for pathology in the duodenum have historically been married to surgeries of the pancreas and biliary drainage system given that intimate association. Attempts to manage and mitigate and control the biliary and pancreatic excretions have led to complications that have given us high and prohibitively high morbidity and mortality rates, particularly in the birth of surgery in this area. So the work of men like Alan Whipple, along with Wal Walter Kausch and William Halstead, have really set the guideposts for surgery of the duodenum and the pancreas through their trials, failures, and successes. So let's meet our patient. Our patient was LL, a 56-year-old female who was referred to the general surgery service after a large sessile duodenal polyp was discovered incidentally on upper endoscopy. She'd initially presented to the gastroenterologist with a history of having swallowed a foreign body, a plastic prong from a plastic fork, and had presented with symptoms of dysphagia. The plan had been for OGD or esophageal gastroduodenoscopy for identification and retrieval of the foreign body. She had no other significant medical history and her general physical exam was within normal limits. 
Among the investigations done, she had routine blood tests that were drawn, a full blood count and complete metabolic panel, and results were only notable for slightly elevated glucose and total cholesterol. On upper endoscopy, however, a large polypoid polyp was discovered in the third part of the duodenum and biopsied. Noting its size, endoscopic polypeptomy was not possible or attempted, and she was referred to the general surgery service for further management. This large hemicircumferential mass-like polyp was encountered again in the distal second or third part of the duodenum. Multiple biopsies were taken and sent from the duodenal mass and the area was tattooed with spot ink in four quadrant fashion to assist with identification. The biopsy findings showed duodenal adenoma without evidence of high grade dysplasia or malignancy. The patient was further sent for focus study computed tomography scan. The images of that scan suggest a thickening within the lumen, within the wall of the duodenum. And here the red arrow is pointing to a density within the lumen of the duodenum, suggestive of the polyp that was seen on endoscopy. The patient was taken for an elective open pancreas sparing distal duodenectomy procedure by the General Surgical Service. Given its size, the endoscopic polypectomy um, would not have been appropriate. And so she was referred to our service for further management. We undertook this approach, removing the third and fourth parts of the duodenum via an open and midline incision, and reconstruction was performed with an end-to-end -end duodenal jejunal anastomosis. Histopathological analysis eventually revealed a tubular villus adenoma. In her post-operative course, it was uneventful, she was able to recommence diet without issue and was discharged home on post-operative day two. Her surgical pathology described a tan polypoid mass measuring five by two by one centimeters. The lymph nodes harvested from the jejunal mesentery and the periduodenal lymph nodes were all found to be negative. The microscopic description of the specimen showed villi and tubules lined by columnar cells with features ranging from normal to mild dysplasia. The margins were negative and without abnormality, and there was no evidence of severe dysplasia or in situ, in situ or invasive cancer. So discussion, what is the best approach to tumors of the third part of the duodenum? Well, first looking at the endoscopic options, Polypectomies can be done, but those are recommended for smaller polyps less than one centimeter. Mucosal resection is another option or argon plasma coagulation. However, complications increase with size of the polyp, and we know that our polyp was five by two centimeters, including bleeding, perforation due to the thinness of the duodenal wall, and recurrence. So endoscopic approaches are better for, for masses less than two centimeters and encompassing less than 33% of the duodenal circumference. At surgery, you have the option of a wedge resection, pancreas sparing segmental duodenal resection, or pancreaticoduodenectomy seen more for tumors in the D1, D2 periampullary area. Surgery tends to be better for larger lesions involving a greater circumference of the bowel wall. And so for lesions greater than two centimeters or evidence of severe dysplasia or evidence of recurrence. AJ Sharma et al. produced this um, diagram or flow chart proposed decision tree on how to choose which surgery to undertake for these tumors within the duodenum. And basically we can see that for proximal tumors involving a smaller percentage of the bowel wall, um, a pancreas preserving limited duodenal resection is appropriate or can be pursued. For more distal tumors or those involving a larger proportion of the circumference, a segmental duodenectomy is suggested. Um, and where the pancreas invo is involved or where there's uh, evidence of adenocarcinoma large size, the pancreaticoduodenectomy is the suggested and recommended course of action. Here again is another decision tree, and this one differentiates into whether the major duodenal papilla is involved or not. Where the major duodenal papilla is not involved, as in our case, so for a non-ampullary duodenal tumor, um, the options include wedge resection with duodenal repair, or segmental distal duodenectomy with duodenogegenostomy. So surgical approaches to the third part of the duodenum. And here I'll discuss exposure, resection and reconstruction options and outcomes. 
So exposure, now we can look at recalling the intimate association of the duodenum and it's partly peritoneal, peritoneal and partly retroperitoneal orientation. The ideal exposure for this surgery involves mobilization of the small and large bowel cephalad or upward away from the midline where the duodenum is located. The cabal brush maneuver or the right medial visceral rotation has been described as the best approach. This maneuver mobilizes the ascending colon and the hepatic flexure of the colon followed by the second part um, and the addition of a wide cockerization or mobilization of the duodenum medially, reflection, reflection of the duodenum medially. Um, and a wide cockerization speaks to the ability to see what we see here, the left renal vein. So you move that duodenum away in its C-shaped orientation, medializing it towards the left, such that you can see the left renal vein. And that is what we did with our patient. So our patient was supine on the operating table and by a midline incision, we did mobilize the ascending colon and performed a cattle brush maneuver with the wide cockerization. The tumor was palpated in the third part of the duodenum and using staple resection, distal resection performed at 40 centimeters distal to the ligament of trites in the jejunum and the proximal resection at the border of the second and third parts of the duodenum. The jejunal limb was then passed behind the overarching superior mesenteric vessels to perform a hand-sewn end-to-end anastomosis with the duodenum. So here we see resection and reconstruction options. So among those resection and reconstruction options, the pancreatico um, duodenectomy is one of the procedures that was previously done for all tumors in the duodenum, as well as tumors in the head of the pancreas. However, given the prohibitive morbidity and mortality initially, surgeons began to search for other options, desire to spare the pancreas and biliary drainage system where possible. They began to experiment with more limited resections of the distal duodenum, as well as the distal second part of the duodenum. And here we can see a few of the options that have been proposed. So one, a few of the options again, a wedge resection. So a wedge resection involving just elimination of the affected area of duodenal bowel wall with a primary anastomosis, so closing the defect. A wedge resection with closure using a jejunal serosal loop of bowel. A segmental resection of the duodenum with an end to end duodeno jejunostomy, as in C, image C, and that is the approach that we took, and a segmental duodenal resection with an side to side anastomosis. So, outcomes what the literature has found, what studies have shown, found is that. Avoidance of surgery on the pancreas and the biliary system where possible, as in non-ampullary distal duodenal tumors affecting D3 and D4, resulted in shorter operative times, less intraoperative blood loss, fewer complications, and a shorter length of stay. So what's next for our patient? Well, in these tumors in the uh, adenoma population in the duodenum, surgical resection is often a complete treatment. Recurrence does occur uh, classically with endoscopic therapy and can be as high as 60%. Surveillance, repeat endoscopy is suggested at three to six months out from having your endoscopic resection surgery. Um, and then for endoscopic resections, they do have to follow up quite frequently every six to 12 months for two years. For solitary non-ampullary adenomas, as in this case with a low-grade dysplasia, the malignant conversion rate is low and 20% will develop a high-grade dysplasia, and around 5% will develop non-invasive malignancy over five years. So some of the benefits, again, of the distal duodenectomy, it avoids the morbidity of a pancreatic resection, especially in the presence of non-ampullary or non-pancreatic disease, where the pancreas itself, the parenchyma, is soft, and the pancreatic duct is small, and that is a perfect setup for one of the most dreaded complications of post-operative pancreatic fistula, which the fistula itself has been shown to decrease survival. There's also the ease of dissection as the duodenum distal to the ampulla vada is actually not particularly adherent to the pancreas and dissection along that plane is much easier. The pancreatico duodenectomy, while reserved for certain indications and has been standard in malignancies of the duodenum in the past, is now something that we can move away from 
with uh, evidence to show feasibility and reliability of a more segmental approach. Not to mention that patients undergoing segmental duodenectomy have reported better um, quality of life perioperatively and improved recovery times. So in conclusion, duodenal polyps are uncommon and pose an interesting management challenge from detection to diagnosis and management, which often entails resection for larger polyps. This case, we hope, adds to the growing discussion of approaches to tumors in the third part of the duodenum that are feasible, safe, and reduce the morbidity of traditional pancreatic duodenectomy. In fact, we're building a case series of work started by Lucas and Francis et al., to which this case will be added. Thank you. And here are my references. Thank you again, Dr. Nottage, and great presentation. So in the interest of time, we're actually just going to move on to the next presenter, who is uh, another keynote speaker, Dr. Tehran Arara. Dr. Arara, basically, um, he's going to give us a talk today on TARC IOL marking, getting it right. Dr. Roy is currently working as a consultant in the eye division, Department of Surgery, Princess Margaret Hospital, Nassau, Bahamas. He completed his residency in ophthalmology and super specialty training in cornea, lens, and refractory surgery services from the India's Apex Institute, Dr. Prasad Center for Ophthalmo Ophthalmic Sciences, Ophthalmic Sciences, All India Institute of Medical Research Sciences, and New Delhi. He has contributed to more than 50 international and national scientific publications and 10 book chapters in the field of cornea, lens, and refractory surgery. He is author of the book, New Investigations in Ophthalmology and Instrumentations in Ophthalmology for Resident Training. He received the Archer Award at the 33rd Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology Conference in 2018 he reserved, received the Best Senior Resident Award at the AIIMS for the, his outstanding work in 2016. He featured amongst the top 40 ophthalmologists less than 40 years of age across the world by the renowned international magazine, The Ophthalmologist, in 2015. His key areas of interest are la, laminar corneal surgeries, as well as um, femtosecond assisted corneal transplantation, pediatric cataracts, complicated cataracts, and high refractive surgery for errors of the, of the eye. He is a reviewer of numerous international journals publishing in the field of cornea, lens, and refractive surgery. He has been invited numerous times as a guest faculty to present at various international and national conferences. Let's thank Dr. Ara and welcome to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Major, for the very kind introduction. And I'd like to, at the outset, I would like to thank the research committee uh, for giving me an opportunity to present uh, in this uh, wonderful session. Uh, my talk is uh, Toric IOL marking, getting it right. And as I understand, like there are uh, different specialty uh, people attending this uh, conference. So I'll start with some basics so we can reach to uh, where uh, we'll be discussing on the on the innovative uh, aspect of this uh, presentation. Okay, so uh, the important part of the eye that is related to this presentation is uh, the cornea and the lens. As we can see, these are the two refractive surfaces that bend the light onto the retina. The cornea is this clear uh, front surface of the eye, and then the lens uh, is here in the center. It can adjust its shape to help focus the uh, light onto the onto the retina, depending on the distance of the object. So in a perfect world, in a perfect shaped eye, uh, all these elements should be like absolutely spherical, like a round uh, curvature, uh, so that the um, light from uh, from all all like uh, dimensions can uh, go and uh, uh, focus on the retina. So you would see a perfect image. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So, however, uh, if the eye is or the, the cornea or the lens is in the shape of an egg, like which means that one of the axes, like the vertical or the horizontal is steeper than the other. As you can see in this image, uh, the red red axis, that is the vertical axis, it's more steeper. And you can see from this curvature. So the light coming on the, on the vertical meridian would focus in front of the retina. 
However, the light on the horizontal axis, the the green meridian, it's uh, it's more accurate and it 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 forms on the retina. So, because of this asymmetry in this uh, steepness of the cornea in the vertical and the horizontal dimensions, uh, the the light from different dimensions are uh, focusing at different areas, causing a kind of a blur. This phenomenon is called astigmatism. It is a kind of a refractive error. So it can uh, this astigmatism can happen in in on both uh, the cornea as well as the lens. Uh, however, because uh, we are will be discussing about the cataract surgery in, uh, in which we normally remove the lens, so the more more important part in our presentation will be uh, this astigmatism uh, in the cornea. So if you see, this is the normal vision on the left, where you can see at one uh, at one time one uh, position like distance, you can see very clearly. And if a person has astigmatism, uh, the image will be more blurry, the lines will be more stretched, and that can cause a lot of problems like headaches and strain in the eye uh, as well. Now, when we are planning to do a cataract surgery in, in a patient, uh, we uh, tend to measure the length of the eye and also the dimensions of the cornea. And we see almost like up to 22% of our patients have substantial corneal astigmatism, which is like more than 1.5 diopter of astigmatism on the cornea. And even like up to 30% patients, like almost one third of the patients will have almost more than a diopter of astigmatism on the cornea. So this is a scan which you see, this is a, is a, is a corneal topography scan, uh, which we do for all the patients who have uh, more than 0.75 diopter of astigmatism. And here you will see this, uh, this red zone on the horizontal axis, everything is in red and on the vertical, everything is in blue. Uh, if you look at the, 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 the keratometry, you can see the steep K and the flat K which shows a, a difference of around four diopter of astigmatism uh, in this patient because the horizontal axis, the 170 axis is much steeper and the, and the, and the vertical axis is much uh, flatter. So in, in this uh, kind of scenario, if we tend to just uh, remove the cataract and put a normal uh, intraocular lens in the eye, which is a standard spherical IOL, uh, the patient will be left with all this corneal astigmatism. And as you saw in the last uh, image, how that will be the quality of the image the, the, the patient uh, would eventually uh, end up with. And so not a very happy patient, although it will still be able to correct with glasses. Uh, but cataract surgery, we, we believe now it's no more like a norm. It's, 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 it's a, we consider every cataract surgery as a refractive cataract surgery, which gives us a wonderful opportunity to correct uh, the all these uh, errors which the patient have and to give them if possible, and to uh, maximize the outcomes without uh, of the vision to uh, the best vision without using any glasses. Uh, so for all our patients who have more than 0.75 diopter of astigmatism, uh, which is uh, really a significant amount, we uh, normally like to put uh, toric lenses, and which I'll show you in the next slide. For less than 0.75 diopter of astigmatism, there are other ways to deal with that, but I'll uh, leave that for now. So this is a toric intraocular lens. You can see these three dots. Uh, on the top and three dots on, on the both the sides. Uh, these dots signif signify that this is not a standard lens. It also has a cylindrical component to it, uh, which is like in this, this particular lens is a positive cylinder, but it could be a, a negative cylinder as well, depending on the uh, make of the lens. So when we implant this lens, it is it gives us an opportunity to correct that four diopter or whatever diopter of astigmatism the patient has. We can plan that and we can correct that. So how do we determine? Like we normally use an online calculator. We where the surgeon will kind of log onto it and just enter all the details of the patient's uh, corneal uh, uh, scan. We will also enter what is his uh, surgically induced astigmatism because when we're doing surgeries and we're making incisions, we are also inducing some amount of uh, flattening or steepening depending on how our incisions are placed uh, on the cornea. So we enter all all those uh, details in this in this calculator. And we end up, uh, the it tells us what is the best model, as you can see over here, like it says T2, T3, T4, T5, and till T9. So these are different models of the lenses with different uh, cylindrical power in them. And so we are able to select like what cylindrical power uh, would be the most appropriate uh, for this patient, depending on what is the post-operative result we would like uh, to see. Now, one interesting fact is like when we are trying to put this lens, uh, we have to uh, align this. So normally when we put a lens in a cataract surgery, uh, we, the, the axis of the lens doesn't matter because the lens is normally a spherical. So uh, if even if the lens rotates in the eye to any direction, it doesn't change anything. But when we are putting these cylindrical lenses, uh, the toric lenses, we need to make sure that they, they are placed in a certain axis because that cylinder is going to act accordingly. 
and and that placement of the cylinder is going to neutralize the uh, the patient's astigmatism uh, what happens is if the patient lies down the eyes normally they it kind of cyclo there's a cyclotorsion which means that the eye either the eye will intort or extort and it's it's very variable for every patient uh, so we cannot like uh, when the patient lies down on the, on for the cataract surgery uh, we at that time it's not possible to mark and know the exact axis because as soon as the patient will get up that axis will change so in order to uh, to basically uh, exactly uh, uh, plan which axis we want the lens to be we need to mark the eye uh, beforehand so one of the methods to do of doing that is is like a toric marker as you can see over here uh, this is a toric marker where you there's a, this is called an air bubble marker this is the one of the most common methods of marking the eye because it's very uh, cost effective you can like kind of uh, uh, clean this uh, marker and then uh, use a like a sterile pen sterile pen to uh, place ink marks on those on the front of it and then this air bubble it is a gravity base so it helps us tell uh, what is the center like how it is placed horizontally so when this bubble is right in the center you see that the marker is absolutely horizontal so we can uh, place like three marks at 0 degree 90 degrees and 180 degrees and then let the patient go inside the operating room and then accordingly mark uh, we're able to mark uh, the desired axis. So suppose if the desired axis is 110 degrees, so if I have some reference marks uh, placed on the patient's eye beforehand and when the patient lies down, even if that marks in tot or extort, I know which is going to be the 0 and 180 degrees and accordingly I can mark the 110 degree or 120 degree or whatever desired axis is uh, required to place the eye well. Uh, in recent, tech, I mean, with technological advances over the last uh, maybe four or five years, we have seen this uh, advent of digital marking. So what digital marking exactly do, does is if we are able to take pictures of the eye uh, from uh, beforehand. And uh, so the what the picture does is it recognizes different like landmark points on the iris and on the, on the, on the conjunctiva. And so it is able to register it. Uh, how the eye is in the normal uh, in the sitting position, and then when the person patient lies down, it gives us a overlay, overlay of these. Uh, as you can see, these three lines. It tells us where is the exact axis where you, that dot, those three dots. If you carefully see between those two lines, are exactly aligned there. So it tells us where those dots need to be. So uh, it is kind of a very uh, um, it's a very great technology because uh, you don't need to put any marks. You don't need to do anything and. Uh, it just gives you, you an overlay while you're performing the surgery. And uh, so that takes away the, that uh, human error or that extra uh, step from uh, the, the surgery. However, uh, it is, it's very uh, less available. I mean, it's not widely available in the world. And it's it's only available at a very few centers because of uh, the cost being a very prohibitive thing. It's it's uh, it makes the 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 the. The microscope, the microscope that have these uh, systems are very expensive, and so the affordability is is uh, the the main issue with this kind of a system. Uh, therefore, uh, okay, now uh, so I'm going to present a video over here. This the same video I presented at the American Society this year at uh, DC. So I'll just uh, stop uh, sharing this thing, and I'll just share the the video. authors have no relevant financial interest to disclose. In current practice, a main goal of the cataract surgeon is to provide spectacle independence to patients after cataract surgery. Many patients undergoing cataract surgery have a significant corneal astigmatism. An estimated 35% of cataract patients have one diopter or more than one diopter of pre-existing corneal astigmatism, and 15 to 20% of them have 1.5 diopters or more of corneal astigmatism. There are several methods for treating coexisting astigmatism in patients undergoing cataract surgery. These methods include steep meridian incision, opposite clear corneal incisions, toric intraocular lens and limbal or corneal relaxing incisions. Toric intraocular lenses are the procedure of choice to correct corneal astigmatism of one diopter or more in cases undergoing cataract surgery. Accurate alignment of the toric IOL is important to achieve the desired astigmatism correction. Because one degree of off-axis rotation results in a loss of up to 3.3% of lens cylinder power, correctly orienting the intraocular lens is most important for successful toric IOL implantation. 
In order to achieve good postoperative visual quality, the misalignment of toric IOL must be controlled within 5 degrees. Many methods are used to align the toric IOL. The most common methods include digital image guided systems or manual marking. At present, manual marking has given way to image guided systems although a few studies have indicated that there is no significant difference in toric IOL axis misalignment between traditional manual marking methods and image guided systems. It is beyond doubt that intraoperative image guided systems provide an important method of toric IOL axis alignment. However, most image guided systems are expensive and require a series of special preoperative examinations with equipment, such as IOL Master, Cassini Topographer, Pentacam, etc., which make them difficult to apply in underdeveloped areas. In the absence of intraoperative image guided systems, accurate manual marking of the toric IOL axis seems to be the only way to provide improved visual outcomes for patients. Marking of the horizontal meridian can be done manually under the guidance of different methods that include slit lamp assisted marking with a horizontal slit beam, slit lamp assisted marking with a pendulum attached marker, or non-pendular marker with a surgeon's direct visualization. These traditional manual marking methods focus on marking the horizontal meridian, and the IOL target axis is marked intraoperatively by special instruments such as a Mendez ring. However, this popular three-step ink marking procedure for toric IOL implantation produced significant alignment error of about 5 degrees in one of the studies. Previous studies also showed that the pendulum marking method was difficult to perform and tonometry could cause misalignment, while the slit lamp marking method was easy to operate and more accurate. When marking with conventional toric IOL markers, it is difficult to achieve an accurate marking as it is difficult to confirm if the instrument is perfectly horizontal. In addition, it is difficult with the bubble and pendulum markers to simultaneously focus on the marker and the patient backquote SI. Smartphones have been used recently to enable better accuracy of manual marking. These use the inbuilt gyroscope and camera in smartphones to help adjust the original planned degree of placement of the toric IOL based on the orientation of these marks. With the smartphone apps like ToriCam and iToric, the reference is marked, the meridian is measured by superimposing gyroscope over a camera picture, and the implantation meridian is then adjusted accordingly. This method has been shown to reduce the reference marking error to 1.28 degrees. However, it leads to a multi-step process with more chances of human error and is also time-consuming. Another innovation in the recent decade has been the use of electronic markers. Electronic toric markers use the senses of sight and hearing to help easily and accurately pinpoint the horizontal axis and stay focused on the patient eyes. The electronic marker, which is an electronic leveling device, uses green, orange, and red light emitting diode lights and a beeping sound to indicate the degree to which the marker is aligned on the horizontal axis. A red light and fast beep indicate that the marker is severely tilted, an orange light and slow beep mean that the marker is slightly tilted, and a green light with no beep signals that the marker is perfectly horizontal. Electronic toric IOL marker gives both audio and visual confirmation of the correct position of the reference marks without diverting attention from the patient's eye. However, there is no external calibration tool provided to verify horizontal level. Also, third wedge for marking the limbus at 6 o'clock is not present. Cost of the instrument also prohibit the universal adoption of the same. We leverage the ability of the smartphone which has an inbuilt gyroscope and the big screen and audio capabilities to propose a one-step marking solution for manual marking. We hereby present to you, GyroToro. Our technique uses the power of smartphone to enable a conventional marker to become an electronic marker thereby giving the essential feedback required to mark the eye accurately. The toric marker is connected to the smartphone using a specially designed case that enables a pocket for handle of the marker. The air bubble can be used to verify the accuracy of the system before proceeding. The smartphone can be held according to the eye to be marked and the screen reverses accordingly. When using the toric marker, we apply topical anesthesia and wait until the secretion of tears subsides. We paint the blades of the toric marker with a marking pen and ask the patient to sit upright while gazing straight ahead with both eyes open. We gently hold the patient's eyelids with fingers to prevent the patient from closing his or her eyes as the marker approaches. 
The surgeon should sit at the same eye level as the patient. This position is helpful for placing the marker on the center of the cornea. Our app Gyrotoro has the functionality to change the screen color from green to orange on a tilt of 2 degrees and to red on a tilt of 5 degrees. There is also an increasingly alarming sound as the device keeps tilting. On reaching exact horizontal position, the device gives a click sound. We also observed how the bubble in the toric marker has a long latency in correcting itself while the inbuilt gyroscope is updated every 100 millisecond. It also shows the exact degrees tilt on the screen, which is not available in any previous marking techniques. It's a simple, reproducible and one-step method to convert the manual marking to smartphone-enabled marking. So basically, we use the 3D printing to manufacture this uh, custom case for that. And uh, that's it. So the idea was to use like the gyroscope and built in the phones and that gives us a more audio and stimulative uh, effect than just using a bubble marker because bubble markers they've seen that uh, it doesn't give any any audio or visual feedbacks so uh, the chances of errors are much higher so uh, this was uh, this was the thing which we tried to innovate on uh, thank you so much thank you dr aurora for that interesting talk and um, we'll be moving on to dr supriya royal who will be giving us a talk today on regression patterns of central serous chorioretinopathy using end-phase optical coherence topography. Dr. Arroyo is a vitreo retinal surgeon and medical retina specialist working as a retina consultant at Princess Margaret Hospital and Bahamas Vision Center, Harbor Bay. She is also an associate lecturer at UWE she completed a residency in ophthalmology and super specialty training in vitreo retina and medical retina at Mo Molana Azad Medical College in Delhi, which is a pr premier institute in India. Her keys, uh, key areas of interest include diabetic retinopathy, central serous chorioretinopathy, and macular hole surgeries. She has published more than 40 papers in reputed international peer reviewed journals contributed to many book chapters and has presented in numerous prestigious international conferences. Currently, she is a leading, she is leading multiple research projects across the globe and is in, in the last three months itself has published over 10 papers in very high impact and prestigious journals of ophthalmology. She is a reviewer of, for many reputed retina journals. Let us welcome Dr. Royal. Uh, good, good afternoon, thank you. Um, Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, I will share my screen now. Okay, so the topic of my presentation is regression patterns of central serous chorioretinopathy using NFAS optical coherence tomography. I have no financial disclosures and no conflict of interest. To introduce, central serous chorioretinopathy is a chorioretinal disease characterized by neurosensory detachment at the posterior pole with or without pigment epithelium detachment due to leakage from the choroid through a defect in the retinal pigment epithelium, outer blood retina barrier. So just to explain this, this is the fundus picture of a patient having central serous chorioretinopathy. As we see here, there is an area of neurosensory detachment that is fluid under the retina in this area. And so the fundus autofluorescence of the same eye shows this whitish area, which is suggestive of sick retinal pigment epithelium. And that is the reason why this neurosensory detachment happened. On fundus fluorescein angiography, you can... Um, you can see this leakage right here. So basically, this is the area of defective retinal pigment epithelium through which the fluorescein dye has leaked out. And so we know this, this is the site of the leakage, which is superior to the fovea. This is the OCT-B scan showing a neurosensory detachment as well as a pigment epithelial detachment right here. Um, so for most of the studies, the parameter that is most commonly used for monitoring the progress or regression of central serous chorioretinopathy is the central retinal thickness, is the thickness from the retinal pigment epithelium up to the top of the retina. 
So uh, this portion here is the outer retina. So outer retina is solely supplied by the blood vessels from the choroid, whereas inner retina receives blood supply from the retinal vessels also. So uh, in case there is neurosensory detachment, basically the outer retina is not receiving blood supply from the uh, choroid and that, that's why outer retina gets atrophied. Acute episodes of central serous chorioretinopathy. One second. Acute episode of central serous chorioretinopathy resolves spontaneously in more than 80% of the cases within first six months and therefore observation is preferred in initial few months at acute presentation. Certain clinical indicators may be predictive of longer episodes of central serous chorioretinopathy, which may warrant an early intervention. In clinical practice, we encounter patients at different stages of resolution of subretinal fluid and persistence of subfovial subretinal fluid raises concerns about the spontaneous resolution course duration. Why are we so worried about the subretinal fluid at the fovea or subfovial fluid? That is because fovea is where the majority of the vision and the high acuity vision comes from. So these are three examples showing different leakage sites. So if there is leakage, let's say inferiorly or temporally or superiorly in this case, and if the fluid does not reach up to fovea, then the eye is going to have a relatively better visual prognosis. But if it is going to involve the fovea and the fluid is going to persist at the fovea for a longer time, then it's going to have a worse visual prognosis. Also, fluid at the fovea will eventually cause outer retinal atrophy, and this damage is going to be permanent. Currently, there is no knowledge on direction of the fluid regression towards the fovea or towards the leak site during this resolution course. This knowledge may be helpful in following up the patient, offering treatment at an appropriate time and possibly preventing structural damage to outer retina. Hence, we carried out this project to study the regression patterns of subretinal fluid in central serous chorioretinopathy on sequential NFAS OCT and its relationship to leak locations. So basically, there are two major aspects which are new, which we are studying in this project. One is assessing the regression pattern. This has never been studied before. So currently, there is no knowledge of the direction of fluid regression. And the second thing new that we are doing is studying on NFAS OCT. I'll show you what NFAS OCT looks like. So, so far, always whether a disease is resolving or is not resolving has always been studied on the B scan, like I showed you. But NFAS is a new um, advanced modality which has not been put to use so much. This was a retrospective study on patients with acute central serous chorioretinopathy. The study adhered to the Declaration of Helsinki. Inclusion criteria was availability of data and sequential OCT and OCT and geography every two weeks until resolution of the disease or six months, whichever is earlier, and presence of a single active leak. We excluded eyes with presence of macular neovascularization or atypical CSCR, diffuse pigment epitheliopathy, and with multiple leaks. The leak site was identified on fundus fluorescein angiography and the eyes were divided into two groups. Group A, where the leakage site was less than 1,000 microns away from the fovea, and group B, where leakage site was more than or equal to 1,000 microns away from the fovea. Serial NFAS OCT scans were evaluated and the area of subretinal fluid was measured using ImageJ software. To demonstrate how we defined regression. We defined regression as centripetal or centrifugal. centrifugal. Centripetal was when the direction of resolution of fluid was towards the fovea. In other words, subfovial subretinal fluid was the last to resolve, which means relatively a worse prognosis. Centrifugal means the direction of resolution of fluid was away from the fovea which means subfovial subretinal fluid was the first to resolve. 
So we had 25 eyes which satisfied our inclusion and exclusion criteria. The mean age of the patients was 41.76 years and the mean duration of the disease was 1.36 months. 20 eyes demonstrated a centripetal regression and five eyes demonstrated a centrifugal regression. Out of the eyes showing centripetal regression, 13 eyes were in group A, which meant that the leak site was less than 1,000 microns away, and seven eyes with a leak site more than 1,000 microns away. Amongst the five eyes which showed a centrifugal regression, three eyes resolved towards the leak site, and three eyes uh, had leak site more than 1,000 microns away from the fovea. Also, out of the 25 eyes, there were 15 eyes in group A and 10 eyes in group B, meaning um, leak site more than 1,000 microns away from the fovea. Mean time of subretinal fluid resolution was 9 plus minus 5-8 months in group A, and it was 11 11.57 plus minus 6.4 months in group B. Amongst the eyes showing cent, uh, amongst the eyes in group A, 13 eyes showed centripetal regression and one eye regressed towards the leak site. Amongst the 10 eyes in group B, seven eyes showed a centripetal regression and two eyes regressed towards the leak site. This is a scattering plot showing the rate of neurosensory detachment area, which was measured on NFAS um, regression, and the rate of central retinal thickness regression from baseline at one month and timing of resolution. So basically, this showed that the prediction of resolution of subretinal fluid at one month was better with NFAS area of subretinal fluid in comparison to central retinal thickness. Measurement and prediction of resolution based on central retinal thickness is the standard of care. So this basically is showing that NFAS area of SRF uh, you know, is better than measuring on central retinal thickness. Now, um, this area under the curve also shows that the rate of first, first month neurosensory detachment area regression showed statistically significant higher area under the curve in identifying cases with resolution later than two months compared to the raised rate of first month central retinal thickness regression. And this was statistically significant. So our study revealed that most of the eyes undergo a centripetal pattern of regression with subretinal fluid resolving at the fovea towards the end of the disease course. In eyes with a leakage point less than 1,000 microns from the fovea, 86% resolved in a centripetal fashion. In eyes with a leak site more than 1,000 microns from the fovea, 70% eyes resolved centripetally and 20% resolved towards the leak site. It is important to study the regression pattern of central serous chorioretinopathy as it has a direct impact on the visual acuity and the quality of vision. When a patient presents with subfoveal subretinal fluid, we need to understand whether the subretinal fluid is in the course of resolution or not and whether to offer treatment at that point or not. The knowledge of the direction of the fluid regression will be helpful to offer treatment or retreatment at an appropriate time. Currently, central retinal thickness or the height of neurosensory detachment is the main parameter used for tracking the fluid dynamics. However, this could be misleading as it may just indicate redistribution of subretinal fluid rather than the actual resolution. Assessment of height of the fluid along with the NFAS area of subretinal fluid will give a more holistic picture of fluid regression or progression. The figure that I just showed also shows that the prediction of resolution at sub of subretinal fluid at one month is better with NFAS area of SRF in comparison to central retinal thickness. Small retinal pigment epithelium uh, leak in acute CACR is unlikely to be sufficient to cause a persistent serous detachment given the strong active and passive transport systems to remove the subretinal fluid. So basically, central serous chorioretinopathy is a diffuse disorder of the RPE fluid transport system that leads to accumulation of subretinal fluid. Increased choroidal thickness in central serous chorioretinopathy could be due to increase in the choroidal vascular diameter or increase in the volume of stroma secondary to edema. Studies have shown that an increased choroidal vascular caliber over choroidal thickness ratio at the leak site as compared to the center. Higher choroidal thickness at the subfovial location and a lower choroidal vascularity index has also been demonstrated. These findings are suggestive that the larger choroidal vessels at the leak site are responsible for the subretinal fluid, 
but the interstitial edema in the choroid at the subfoveal location persists for a longer time and thus subfoveal subretinal fluid may be the last to resolve. This could be the possible explanation why most eyes in this study showed resolution of subfoveal SRF in the last and mean time of resolution of SRF was longer if the leak site was more than 1000 microns away from the fovea. Centrifugal pattern may represent slow weakening of the leakage when subretinal fluid resolves under the fovea sooner than the leakage completely stops. Additionally, it may be more likely if the leak is in the lower half of the detachment. This is all showing NFAS uh, images of how the fluid is regressing. Centripetal pattern may reflect two situations. One, when leakage quickly stops and this area is attached first, which is more likely if the leak is in the upper half of the detachment and the fluid migrates downwards, accumulating under the fovea. Second, when the leak is close to the foveal center and when there is no other alternative to a centripetal regression. The regression pattern is important because in a weak leakage, it is important to know if there is a possibility for the fluid to spare fovea. In other words, the cases where the fluid remains under the fovea until the last follow-up will have a high risk of visual impairment due to foveal outer retinal atrophy. Strengths of our study include that we were able to obtain two weekly sequential scans and NFAS imaging that allowed us to deduce the regression pattern very well. Limitations of the study include its retrospective nature and a small study sample. Because of the small sample size, impact of various treatment modalities on regression pattern could not be evaluated. However, the overall trend was towards centripetal regression. The three eyes in our study which resolved with observation had a centripetal regression pattern. It would be interesting to study the natural regression pattern without subjecting the eyes to treatment in a larger sample size. Also, the conclusions are not applicable to chronic CSCR or CSCR with multiple leaks. To conclude, our NFAS-based analysis of sequential OCTs of regressing CSCR demonstrated a tendency of the subfovial SRF to resolve towards the end or a centripetal pattern of regression. Our study also shows better correlation of SRF area or N on NFAS imaging as compared to central retinal thickness in regressing CSCR. Future studies with larger sample size are required, uh, required to study the regression pattern with various treatment modalities and how the regression varies with different categories of CSCR. We just published this paper very recently. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arroyo, on a well put together paper as well as presentation and congratulations on your recent publication. In the interest of time, we're actually going to move on to the closing remarks done by Dr. Srikanth. So if we have any further questions, please place them in the group chat and we will forward them on to the presenters. Thank you again. I'd like to thank the committee for allowing me this opportunity to be a moderator and Dr. Srikanth, if you're available. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I just wanted to thank all the participants who have stayed back to the end of the conference and uh, <clears throat> really had a wonderful, sumptuous uh, knowledge being presented to all of us. Uh, first of all, as a reminder, the attendance to the conference was free, but if anybody requires CME points, please follow the link to pay the $100 fee and they would be given the CME. Secondly, um, there have been so many brilliant presentations from the residents um, but the selection of award for the residents is indeed a difficult task. I don't know who the judges are, but they will have a great difficulty ahead of them. But we will get, once the results are decided, we'll get back to you. Having said that, I would like to thank all our key stakeholders, the Ministry of Health, the PHA, the uh, Medical Association of Bahamas, Physician Alliance. Um, thank you. Special thanks to the research committee, conference committee, um, Dr. Halliday. Uh, the administrative ta staff, Tanya and Diosha. And uh, it was a wonderful um, knowledge that was shared starting on first day from the COVID pandemic from our um, PAHO representatives, CARFA, National Ethics and Stem Cell Committee, the University of Miami, to our own local graduate, uh, graduates and postgraduates presenting our topics. Um, 
I know there have been a wide variety of topics from bench research to observational studies, KAP studies, case reports. I just hope that all of these studies are published. And I really want to thank um, the people, the pay presenters who have sent their abstracts that could be put in the future supplement of the West Indian Medical Journal. But I would strongly encourage all of the presenters to kindly publish this data because once we publish this data, this data will then be accessible to all the future uh, researchers who can then get back to this data. Otherwise, we will just have anecdotal references that this study was done in the past. So uh, once again, thank you. I, have, I hope you all had a wonderful time. And until next year's conference, uh, stay safe. Goodbye. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. Thank you all. Bye-bye.